Hello, everybody. I'm Rick Campbell, welcoming you to NBA Vault as we dip into the archives for another chapter of Hoop History. This week, we remember one of the NBA's most unlikely stories, the Golden State Warriors' run to the 1975 championship. And joining me with their insights, NBA TV's mad dog, Fred Carter, and esteemed NBA TV columnist from the New York Post, Peter Vesey. Fellas, it's great to be with you reliving the 75 Warriors. I'm not going to do it tonight, but I found out how he got his nickname, Mad Dog. We're going to do that some other time. <laughs> Earl Monroe told me the other day. A it'll teaser for a future <laughs> episode. I like it. I like it. You're all going to have to stay tuned for that. But right now, we've got the story of the 75 Warriors. And when the season began, nobody expected much from the young and untested Warriors. They did have superstar Rick Barry, and they made some noise by winning the Pacific Division. But Golden State hardly seemed like a title threat when they opened the playoffs against Seattle. On the West Coast, the Seattle Supersonics and the Golden State Warriors were playing in what the experts were calling the runner-up playoff. The feeling was that it mattered little who won because the winner had to play the victor of the Kansas City-Chicago series. When Archie Clark, Fred Brown, and Tom Burleson led the Sonics to a win in Oakland, there was gloom in the Bay Area. Bill Russell would now lead his troop to the more friendly confines of the Seattle Center Coliseum. The Golden State Warriors were now definitely the underdog, but they had gotten used to that role as many had thought at the beginning of the season that they couldn't even make the playoffs. They not only made them, but with Rick Barry leading the way, they turned the tables and won in Seattle. Then the Warriors won the fifth game at home to take a three to two advantage. The Sonics were favored to take the sixth game in Seattle and send the series back to Oakland for the decider but the Warriors had made some decisions of their own and the series never left Seattle. In the West, Chicago and Golden State were at two games each. Then came the fifth match in Oakland. Most experts felt that the team who won this game would win the series. The Bulls' experience paid off as they added some scoring power to their vaunted defensive strength and came away from Oakland needing only one victory to clinch the Western Conference title. Now Chicago had the home court advantage and seemed determined to end it here at the Chicago Stadium. They jumped into a nine-point lead, securing the knowledge that the best defense in the NBA would protect it. The word around the league was, once Chicago gets ahead, you can't play catch up with them. Somehow the word had not filtered down to the Warriors. Bill Bridges, playing in his last season, started to control the board enabling Rick Barry and company to put on an offensive show rarely seen against the Bulls. Barry poured in 36 points, and suddenly the clubs were headed back to the West Coast for the final showdown. 12,787 loyal Warrior fans packed the arena. The fans believe, even though they were warned by the experts, that experience makes the difference when you get down to the seventh game like this. And that experience was evident in the early going. The Bulls had timing, range, and poise. By halftime, they also had a nine-point lead and visions of a championship. But Chicago had to face the full force of Coach Al Adel's strategy. The Bulls weren't playing just five men on the floor. They were playing a whole bench full of Warriors. Each substitution seemed to strengthen, not weaken Golden State. The blue and gold just kept coming, and the fans shouted. Rookie Jamal Wilkes, with no playoff experience, caught fire. Old pro Jeff Mullins cut loose. Superstar Rick Barry sparkled. For the 11 players who saw action in that game, for their frenetic, fanatic, fantastic fans, it was a wonderfully mad evening. The Golden State Warriors were champions of the Western Conference. Their fans celebrated the occasion with a demonstration of joy never seen before in the Coliseum Arena. And it was a fitting end to the season in Oakland. The arena schedule makers had been so sure that the Warriors would not be in the finals, they had booked an ice show. And the Warriors would have to play the championship round across the bay. 
So, as the ice show headed for Oakland, the Warriors had to move their finals games over to the Cow Palace in San Francisco. And that actually worked in their favor because Rick Barry and some of his teammates played there before and were familiar with those tricky rims. Now, Peter, the big <laughs> trade that year was dealing Nate Thurman for Clifford Ray right before the season started. Uh, seems like a bold move, and it, and it triggered a championship. How did that work? Well, it wasn't a bold move. It was a financial move. There was uh, a contract situation, and uh, the Warriors decided to trade Nate to, uh, to the Bulls. And they could have had uh, Tom Borwinkle or Clifford Ray, and they said, absolutely, we want Clifford Ray. Uh, he called a team meeting almost uh, the first few weeks in, in the, on the team because he saw there was resentment toward Rick Barry. Rick, Rick had had a bad knee, and it was swelling up on him, and he was taking uh, practices off. And so when Rick was out of doing something, he called a team meeting without the coaches, and he said, look, you guys, I want to ask you a question. Who on this team can go out on the court and get 35 to 40 points on a nightly basis? Who can go out and play 45 to 48 minutes a night and we can depend on you every night the way Rick is? It is what it is and let's move on. And there was no problem. I mean, he was there legitimately were hurt. It wasn't like he was tanking well, practices. Well, whatever. I mean, that, that's what was going <laughs> on. And, and uh, you know, I spoke to Al Isles about it recently. He didn't even know about that team meeting. Hmm. Clifford Ray, talking about a rebounder, a physical, tough player. Uh, screen and rolls. That's how the Golden State won, Warriors won that title, right? Screen and roll, usually a screen and pop because the big guy pops, makes a jump shot. Well, Clifford Ray, George Johnson were not jump shot shooters, so Rick, coming off that screen roll, right. had to do it all. But that was the beauty of that team, Freddie, that they, you know, he mentioned a couple times there, played 10 or 11 guys, and we just talked about the two centers. You know, George was the shot blocker, Cliff was the physical presence. And then you moved on to, you know, they, they I'll name all the guys, I mean, CJ, right, Charles, Charles Johnson. Johnson he, yes. You know, he, he was like, uh, he was the fighter on the team, and he was a great corner jump off shooter. The bench, knocking down right. jumpers. Derek Dickey was the guy that would come down court and make plays. Uh, you had uh, Dudley, Charles, Charles Dudley. Dudley, right. He could not be pressed. Right? They called him the cut man, the slasher. <laughs> <laughs> you had Bill Bridges. He taught the, me how to screen roll. Bill Bridges, Bridges heck of a player. And we you didn't guys mention, are old, but we got to go to break real quick. we got three more <laughs> segments right. left to talk we about. Love this, we love Warriors. this Warrior team. I know, I know. We love Rick Barry and this Warrior team. And they had raised plenty of eyebrows by making the finals. But the biggest surprise was still yet to come. And we'll bring you that part of the story on the other side of this break. Stay with us. came into the season, all the prognosticators actually picked us to be last in the conference, last in the division, and also last in the league, probably. And uh, the one thing about that team that I've always admired was the fact that they never believed what was said about them, good or bad. Early in the year, when nobody believed them, they didn't, you know, they didn't think about it from a, from a bad standpoint. When we started playing pretty well going you know, through the season, and they start saying some nice things about it. They didn't believe that either. So I, I have always said every coach needs to have one team like that because you remember them very, very well. Indeed, and with their drive to the 1975 Finals, Al Adels and his Warriors had surprised the NBA and captivated the fans in the Bay Area. But everybody figured the joy ride would come to an end when they faced the Washington Bullets. That year, the Bullets had won 60 games and completely dominated the East. In fact, many predicted a sweep in the finals, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> ah, but it turned out the Warriors were the ones wielding the broom. So, with Boston eliminated, the Washington Bullets prepared to take on the Golden State Warriors. One thing was certain, there would be a new world champion in 1975. As the championship round began in Washington, it seemed the experts had been right. The Bullets jumped to a 16-point lead. But while the Capitol Center crowd prepared to celebrate again, the Warriors continued to battle. They caught the Bullets and won the opener. Games two and three were scheduled in the Cow Palace on the San Francisco side of the bay. Neither team had played there for several seasons. Once again, the Bullets jumped into an early lead. With less than three minutes to play in the first half, Washington led by 13 points. 
in that less than three minutes remaining, Rick Barry tossed in 10 points, closing the gap and giving the Warriors the impetus they needed. The Golden State captain also scored the first two baskets of the second half, and his teammates picked it up from there. Wilkes, who would become Rookie of the Year, found his scoring touch. As the Bullets fought back, the Golden State defense tightened. The fans sensed it, the players sensed it, the momentum now was the Warriors. No, the momentum didn't swing over to Golden State. They went out and fought for it, worked for it, and won it. The Bullets had to be wondering what one had to do to beat the Warriors. They had held leads of 16 points in the first game and 13 points in the second game and lost them both. Warrior fans felt they had the answer. The fans were so jubilant that Warrior coach Al Adels had to display some of his playing day speed to keep ahead of them. Three nights later, the scene was the same, but the scenario was not. This time, the Warriors did not fall behind. This time, only a few points separated the teams until the third period. Then the Warriors turned it on. Those experts who had been predicting a four-game Washington sweep were beginning to think about the impossible. Not just a Golden State victory, but could the Warriors do the sweeping? That impossible dream came closer to being a reality as the Warriors took game three and the team's wing to Washington. Now the Bullets were fighting with the ferocity of a team that did not want to be known as the club who had lost the world championship in four games. This time, the Bullets jumped in front by 14 points and were playing like a team determined to hold on to that lead, increase it if they could. lost the services of coach Al Adels, who ran onto the floor to protest Bullock's strong-arm tactics and was banished to the locker room. But Adels' action seemed to act as a catalyst as the Warriors began the tactics that had earned them the nickname the Cardiac Kids. Underdogs all season, even in their own division, the Warriors use their bench strength and their secret ingredient. They call it togetherness. The attack was led by Barry. But it was so well balanced that as the bullets concentrated on him, they got hurt as he passed off. The winning point came on a toss from the charity line, but the game was won the same way the Warriors had been winning all season. All their many talents putting it together for the victory. Rick Berry was voted the most valuable player in the playoffs. It's not too difficult to figure out why. Rick only led the team in scoring, assists, steals, and fired a sensational 92% from the free throw line. The Warriors returned home to a 2 a.m. airport reception. Yes, they had been called the Cardiac Kids. Later, they were called Destiny's Darling. Now they were being called champions of the NBA. So, in what many consider the greatest upset in finals history, the Warriors captured their first and to this day only NBA championship. But it wasn't exactly a blowout. They won the four games by a total margin of 16 points. Now, these guys were underdogs the entire playoffs, especially against Washington. And how much motivation did that provide? I mean, these guys were counted out from before the season, during the season, and before the finals, and they won the chip. Go on. Well, you heard Al, Al Adels talk about, and Rick, I'll let you talk about it also, about the team that he had. He had a team of no names but one star, and they came together. And you talked about what Adels told you. Um, Adel said that he, he watched the uh, TV the night before and they were picking the Bullets to win in four games. And they said there's no way this team is going to win uh, a game, not even a game. If they do win one, it'll be a fluke. Right. So, so uh, he told that to the team before game one. There was no strategy session. Joe Roberts, the assistant, was going to give the strategy. He said, no, no, wait, wait, whoa. I haven't slept all night after listening to this on TV. I'm going to tell you, did you guys listen to what these guys said about us? And they had a team that everybody came together. And, you know, that's a wonderful thing for a coach because it doesn't happen often. Sometimes you have a five-game winning streak, seven games where they come together. But when they come together at the right time to win a title, as Al said, it's a beautiful thing. Really quick, we're running short on time. Biggest upset in NBA history? For championships, yes. 
How about, how about, how about you know, of all time? I, I can't, I can't say because that's the last time I was correct about picking a champion. I, I, I covered that series and I actually picked the Warriors. You did not pick the Warriors. No, I, well, we'll look it up. Okay. I did. We can, we can bet on that one. Do we have tape one. of you <laughs> on record picking the Warriors? Well, we, on, in, a, in a story, absolutely. But it's the last time I was right. So, <laughs> so I don't think it was one of the all-time upsets. For championships, I'll say yes. Okay. You know, you got regular season games, the first round, right. the playoffs. For championships, yes. Right. Well, Rick Barry considers it the greatest upset in the history of sports. You guys, well, close. All right, we got to take a closer look at the man who put the Warriors on his back that season, Hall of Famer Rick Barry, when we return. For Rick Barry, the 1975 championship was the crowning achievement of a Hall of Fame career. He's the only player ever to win scoring titles in the NBA, ABA, and NCAA. But there was more to his game than just putting points on the board. He was one of the league's most versatile forwards, not to mention one of the fiercest competitors. And in this profile from Vintage NBA, it's Rick himself who gets things rolling. And now I want you people to sit down and relax, because what you're about to see, you may not believe even after you've seen it. All-American for the University of Miami in 65. Rick Ferry drives for 38 points. Has the most Barry hits it off the run. What a big shot. Barry knocks it away on the field. Rick Barry has not missed the free throw. Oh, no, a nice shot by Barry. Barry hits another out there. Barry again right on target. Oh! What a great play by Rick Barry! Let's get to the film. Rick Barry, one of basketball's true legends and most unique individuals. An instant success in the NBA, Rick grabbed the spotlight from his earliest days in the league. Here, Civic Auditorium, is where young Rick Barry works the night shift for the San Francisco Warriors. Barry dazzles the eye and quickens the pulse in a sport which combines the grace of ballet with the ferocity of the street brawl. For somebody my size, I, I had pretty decent quickness and I had an ability to go to the basket as well as the ability to shoot the ball from the outside. Bill King, our radio announcer, I remember dubbed me the Miami Greyhound. This guy would just run and shoot, run and shoot. That's all he knew about the game of basketball. And the guy was so good that when we used to play, we had to have three different guys guard him at a different time because he'd run them all ragged. Rick was named Rookie of the Year, but he was just getting started. Displaying his trademark intensity, he averaged 36 points a game in his second season, ending Will Chamberlain's seven-year reign as scoring champion. Barry was named MVP of the All-Star Game in front of the hometown fans. He led the Warriors to the 67 Finals, where they lost to Chamberlain's great Philadelphia team. Barry continued to excel for the next four seasons in the ABA with the help of his unorthodox free-throw shooting style, a style he would showcase once again in the NBA when he returned to the Warriors for the 1973 season. Well, you know, he was a perfectionist, you know, all great players are perfectionists. Here comes the underhanded free throw motion, so deadly. Barry wants it. Go to Rick Barry. Yeah! For Rick, it all came together in 1975. Chosen as team captain, he combined leadership, talent, and his fierce competitive drive to turn Golden State into a contender. When you talk about key players to watch in this game, I guess you have to start with Rick Barry. He has perhaps become the, the best all-around basketball player in the NBA this year. He was uh, obviously the leader of the team. Uh, he was the star. And he is certainly the man that they build their entire offense around. And a Clifford Ray can set a screen and get him open for a jump shot. It's almost an automatic two points for Rick. Ray off the lane. Barry comes around behind the screen. There's the shot. It's tied up. He might run off. 15 straight points. Rick Barry ready to fire again. Oh, he's burning him now. He is just burning him. Some nights he just steps across this half court line and turn it loose. Barry wants it. There's Rick now this time. Oh, oh God. Did you see that shot then? Barry led the Warriors on a magical playoff ride that ended with a stunning sweep of Washington in the finals. The best part of the game for me, winning. There's no substitute for winning. And, and that's what it's about. It's about winning. It's about this about winning a championship. Other than that, uh, it doesn't really have any great meaning. What a stud. Rick earned that <laughs> ring with a career season in 1975. He averaged 31 points a game, led the league in free throw percentage, 
and steals, and he was sixth in assists. And fellas, you know, Fred, you played against him. Peter, you go way back with Rick Barry. I want each of you to give the viewers at home a story to amplify his competitiveness. <laughs> First of all, you talk about the conquering all the A's. NCAA title, NBA title, ABA title. He's a man that conquered all the A's. But coming into the NBA uh, as a rookie, everyone felt because the skinny guy out of, out of, out of the University of Miami, they were going to break him in half. He wasn't strong enough. He was skinny. He wasn't tough enough. Average 25, 26 points a game his rookie year. Second year, led the league in scoring. What a tough, hard-nosed competitor who could play. I know I had to guard him. Well, I stood in front of him at times, <laughs> and he scored over me. What a great player. Well, I, you know, I covered him for three years uh, when he played for the Nets. You know, I, I, used, I used to think that he'd lead the league in getting punched out by players. I mean, <laughs> Mike Reardon, you know, perfect example. But, but what I learned the other day from Al Adels was is that when they had the 10 guys playing in practice every day, it was, he said it was one of the most brutal practices every day because you had 10 guys that were going to play. So I said, well, how many of the guys punched out Rick? He said, no, no, never happened. Never happened. You know, George Johnson, who played on that team right. and was the last guy to shoot underhand free throws, Rick, Rick told him. him right? um, I asked him to size up the Warriors. Can you give me their greatness? Tell me their greatness. He says, I'll do it in one word. Rick. Wow. Rick Barry was that great, <laughs> and Rick Barry has that ring to prove it, and he is very, very proud about that, as well he should be. we got to take another quick timeout. We're coming back with more on Rick Barry and the 1975 Warriors here on The Vault. Welcome back to NBA Ball. We're here to bring the curtain down on the story of the 1975 Golden State Warriors. And Peter, part of the legacy of this team, at least, has to be the depth. Guys like Butch Beard, Phil Smith, Jamal Wilkes, who started the year as Keith. What about Butch Beard? How key was he? Well, Keith was the quarterback of the team, and uh, everybody will tell you he was like a drill sergeant out there, uh, meticulous. The, uh, the offense was spit-shined. And they will say that the, the biggest mistake that team made was trading him during the offseason because they became a better, uh, they, they won more games the following year, 59, but they weren't as good a team. There were so many good players. Uh, Phil Smith, one heck of a player. This guy could score. I know that for a fact. He dropped 45 on me, and it was like, and I'm trying to guard him, and the more he made, the more I tried to guard, the more he made. What a heck of a player, Russell. Yeah, well, and let me just say about Phil Smith. You know, he had five really good seasons with the Warriors. Yes. He was 20 points a game after that first year when he averaged seven as a rookie. But in that finals, he had a dunk on Elvin Hayes, a lefty dunk when Elvin waiting on him. And he dunked on it, which I will never forget my whole life. Had he not torn his Achilles tendon in his about his sixth year, you're talking about a guy who was in the, in the same category as a Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe. His second year in the season, he made second team all pro. And I know what he did to Elvin because Elvin had a way of turning his back to you, luring you to the basket, and then turn and check it. But as he turned, he was late. Do you remember that, Don? Yes. Oh, and Phil got him. Man. So, gentlemen, right before we go here, uh, uh, where does Rick Barry stack up all time in the lexicon of NBA greats? I mean, people talk about Larry Bird. He was Larry Bird before Larry Bird. There's no question they're absolutely on that same plateau. Oh, no question about it. Rick could flat out get it done. I mean, he got it done in a tough, physical, hard-nosed league where they broke your nose. They knocked you down. Talk about body checks and physical. It all happened to him. He kept bouncing back. Tough, great player. So at the very least, Rick Barry, one of the greatest players of all time, and that upset, the 75 Warriors over the Bullets, one of the greatest upsets of all time. We'll have to leave it at that for now, as that does it for this week's edition of NBA Vault. For Fred Carter and Peter Vesey and our entire NBA TV crew, I'm Rick Kamla. Thank you for joining us.